And today is Sunday, June 25th, 2017. And school is officially in. Funkier every time I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> These headphones I'm wearing just really makes everything loud because it has the bass in it. Just yeah, that bass is that's making all about that, that bass. That beat is banging in my ears. No trouble. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> all about that bass. <laughs> so, um, before we get started, we want to make sure that we say rest in peace. My man, Prodigy. That was a tough um, loss. Yes, it was a rest peace, loss. Mobby forever. It was a very, very tough loss for all of us. And like everybody's listening to Prodigy versus I can't, I can't do it yet. But you can't do it yet. I can't do it yet. It's too soon. Man. You can't listen to uh, any of it. No, man. I know. I found, I, I found myself tearing up the other day. Man, I was listening. Man, I was listening. You know, I ain't even a big fan of them Jones, but I was listening to them Bumpy Johnson Jones, man. <laughs> I like them Jones, man. I, I like the. I like the first one. You were crying some man tears. Man tears. It's, it's okay to cry, fellas. It's okay to cry. I don't let nobody tell you different. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that. I'm gangster. <laughs> 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 right. Shout out to Dio Rex. Shout out to He used to always crack me up with that. But not not to be, you know, just dogging on his grandma. I'm sorry that grandma passed away. Yeah. Of he course. Had a point, that's, though. that's always sad. It's always sad. Um and of course because Prodigy Prodigy and I are the same age, so everybody knows how old I am now. By the way, um this is Mitch. And I am joined today with my my two eminent co-hosts. Mm, you, guys, new word. you guys are gonna be eminent this week. Eminent. Eminent. Uh, yeah. Eminent with an E or an I? With an E. <laughs> <laughs> oh snap! <laughs> the always precocious but ever pernicious ant. Ooh, I don't know what neither one of those words be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do know precocious. I know precocious. And uh, the profound but never perfunctory Aaron. What's up, everybody? <laughs> and today we're talking about two books. And they're both fairly new, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah pretty much. Black Privilege by Charlemagne the God. And it, this is it where has he would some say, He would say what? New York Times and tell him. Yeah, he would say that. He was like very adamant about that. It's actually and been, it be. congratulations. Well I mean, you know, okay. Fine, you said that give us some, I guess. He could see applause. <laughs> Sir Charlemagne and his seven weeks. His seven yeah. week reign right now. And the other book, I think we all agree that we enjoyed a little bit better than his book. I'd go as far as to say a little more than a little bit. Uh, Angie Martinez's book taught my voice. And yeah, that's and a good I one. Think, I think we enjoyed her book just a little bit more, but we'll get into that. So, um, I guess we can like, tackle it chapter by chapter. What did you think of um, his format? I think he was very serious about those principles he set out to explain. How many of them were there for everybody? You know, there, There's eight that I know of. Yeah, I think I only know about four or five. I, I ain't gonna lie to you, I ain't finished the whole book. I, I I got to the seventh one, the beginning of the seventh one, when I realized I had to hustle. I had to hurry up and get through them. He had but, eight. Um, eight. 
Yeah. But we all, I think we all can agree that we're not like his intended audience with this one. Not really. Yeah, um, that's pretty obvious. I think I think what he was going for as far as format is, it seemed like you know he uh, kind of followed the uh, format of uh, the Forty Eight Laws of Power or some shit like that. Yeah, he talks about that all the time, so it it only makes sense that he'd be influenced by it. He talked about it, it in the, in the, the book too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, he talked about the Forty Eight Laws of Power in the book too. At least in terms yeah. of format. Yeah. Well, he and then he throws some antidotes in there too. He throws some antidotes in. He throws in some, some like some stories about growing up. In he grew up in. Okay, let me see if I can pronounce it right. Monk's Corner. Sounds right. Sounds right. Yeah, Monk's Corner, South Carolina. One of those Carolinas. And he was basically a badass. Cause like chapter well at first he wasn't his mother his mother was an English teacher mm-hmm. right and, and she introduced books into his life and so he at first he was a nerd he was a good student and then his father kind of like sucked it up <laughs> <laughs> his cousin. Well, but his father associated his behavior as being, like, basically gay. Uh, but early on, too, yeah, he attributes that to how he was received in class amongst his peers. Well, because he was extremely intelligent, which is... That's, that was one of the biggest problems in, in this book for me, is that it there was so much of it that was contradictory. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Like his dad kept telling him how bad he was fucking up, but I mean, his dad was a hustler. Dylan, like they wound up in jail together at one point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, you're yeah. telling me you don't do what I do. That's not how life works, Dad. That's not very effective. That's not an effective way of parenting. <laughs> no. So I mean, and, and he kept calling him a screw up. When, but I mean, you pretty much dumped him off with his cousins and let them use him as a football uh-huh. because he said, because he said Ronnie was cute and BBD. <laughs> 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 there was there was a part in the book where where he was sitting amongst his sisters one day. And they were arguing about who was the cutest member of BBD. And he chimed in with it. And I guess his father, that was his way of dealing with him being too effeminate or becoming effeminate in his eyes. That's a whole nother conversation for another episode. It is a whole nother conversation. But um, how how old was he when that happened? I this think pretty he early was in the book. young. Yeah. The elementary school. It might have been. Yeah. Mm. Well, because remember he was, I think it was middle school because remember he had his, his no, it was before that because he had his glasses on and he was smart and he was reading and he was ahead he of fanny pack. <laughs> he had he a fanny pack. He had a fanny pack. pack. <laughs> and actually, I think it might have been because, oh, I think it might have been when he went into middle school because remember when he first went into middle school, he was he was tracked and so he was one of the only black kids that was in an A class mm-hmm. and the rest of the, the kids were in a B or a C or whatever and even though he was intelligent that's like some subliminal shit basically that's telling you you being intelligent is associated with being too white that's what's <laughs> fucked up about us that's the reason that's- why we can't get ahead this might be a little unrelated. This might be a little unrelated, but that's part of the reason why I dug the movie Dope so much. Because they actually say that at the beginning when they're introducing the characters. Mm-hmm. They're like they're known for doing white shit, like getting good grades and applying to college. <laughs> yeah. Like why would his why wouldn't his father support that? Like why would you support him getting good grades and 
Instead, yeah. you're saying, oh, that shit is not manly, so let me throw you in here with your cousins who are thuggish. And you see where that led them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty That's pretty much a um, revolving door for us a lot of times. I don't understand it, though. But, yeah. Because, because then after that, after he starts acting the way that he's going to act based upon what you basically thrown him into, now you're telling him to fuck up. <laughs> True. Right. True. I mean, like, what? The, what do you want? Which one do you want? <laughs> I don't understand. So that's a problem. That's a problem that's big in the black community. Yeah, it is. but that that goes back to what we were talking about as far as like parents and not being balanced. Like you know, like when you got like a, a a father that's going to that extreme about it. Like oh, well, you you you. Kind of Soft because of this blah 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 blah. So you know they put you in a different type of environment or whatever whatever they do to try to you know fit what they want you to be. You know what I'm saying? You know the same thing can happen when you know you primarily raised by your mom. Like that's another extreme of it. So I will say I'm glad that he's currently talking to a therapist though. He said himself he's currently talking to a therapist. I'm glad for that because a lot of our celebrities that are now gone. I say should have sought counseling. That's true. Yeah, so I'm I glad thought, he's I thought that. he was gonna be talking about more of the supernatural shit that he was talking about in the very beginning in principle one. That shit was weird. <laughs> 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 he almost lost all credibility for that. If I hadn't <laughs> But I mean I feel like we all got a similar story somewhere. Well, he was so he so in chapter. Well, it's really chapter three, I think, and it's principle one. Principle one is it's not the size of the pond, but the hustle in the fish. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how he how this plastic man on a tractor <laughs> was basically taunting him, was like messing with him, like was like get out there and do something with yourself, boy. <laughs> 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 and he said like every other day this plastic tractor man would just come and be fucking with him and one day he got so angry at it he threw it in the fire was was his and mama he, smoking weed in the upstairs room or something and he just caught contact and didn't realize it <laughs> his mom didn't smoke weed she was a devout Jehovah's Witness remember I don't know man everybody got their skeleton now, now his dad I don't know I can't tell you about that one uh, but he took the. But he, remember, he told his mom, and she was like, "Oh yeah, oh okay." Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would have like, oh, <laughs> He's like, "Oh, oh really? Oh, okay, little plastic man talking to you on a on a tractor. I got you." And then he threw it in the fire, and it started to scream. He said he was screaming <laughs> as it was melting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he goofy as all her. He said he regrets not rescuing it. That's what caught me. You regret it not rescuing it. Like, come on, bro. <laughs> he starts now. This is something that I've definitely heard of before because my people are from down south. He was talking about hags that come sit on your I, chest. I've heard about that too. I actually experienced that myself. That do what? Yeah. That's the worst feeling in the world. Like when you sleep but you wake up and you can't talk, you can't move. Like that's. Oh the worst yeah, yeah, yeah. I had that yeah. happen before. That's the worst, yo. I actually have had that happen to me before, too. That's why I didn't want to say nothing. Because if you don't believe in the plastic man, I didn't think maybe you would believe in the hags. <laughs> I mean, my supernatural spectrum only goes but so far. So that, so, so you draw a line at plastic men on tractors? <laughs> That's a little extreme. That's a little extreme. None of my toys picked on me. None of my toys picked on me. None of mine either. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, we didn't... See, you guys didn't live through Phantasm 1 and, you know, 2 and 3 and, like, Poltergeist and shit. We Maybe he was sure trying to Poltergeist doll movies. We had our share of possessed dolls. Slabby from Goosebumps is still one of the scariest creations ever. That's true, too. <laughs> now, he talked about seeing his dead grandmother, too, which that I have actually done, like, um... 
not in the way he does, but like I'll go to sleep and I'll be talking to my grandparents on the porch. Yeah. And it'll be me as the age I am now, but they'll be sitting there talking to me about everything that has been going in my life. And I wake up, it, it seemed like it was really real. Yeah, I've experienced I think that we too. all had that. I think we all like talked to like, you know. But, um, but the part that's being left out here is we're skipping is like he said it and like it happened in dreams. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think we all yeah, had that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. In the in the yeah. in the grandparent part, yeah, the man on the tractor was not a dream. That wasn't a dream. No, I don't know. I don't know about that one. No, that was maybe. Maybe I, it was I can't like, discount his experiences. If he swears by it, hey, whatever floats your boat. Well, the South gets really hot. Sometimes when it gets super hot, people start hallucinating, having heat hallucination. That's what I was yeah. thinking. Maybe. All of my life. <laughs> Well, you and back in the day, all kids did was stay outside. We had to be back before the street light came on. Yeah, he, he probably said sat that under that sun, getting his uh, egg fried, his egg scrambled. He, said that too. he would be that he said you could be out all you know night. You just had to make it home before dusk. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I do, I do have a recurring dream where I sit and have a conversation with my pop. And like he knows he's dead and he's got a limited amount of time to have this conversation. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of crazy. It really is. <laughs> that's crazy to me though. Like I've always, I've always thought that um, that's how um, that kind of stuff worked. Like you know, people like naturally, like in the afterlife, connect with us through our dreams. Yeah. That's how it all. It makes sense. Thought. It makes sense. Yeah, that make more. Yeah, that make more sense to me than you know, skate toys. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why I had renegade toys. Renegade toys. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> what kind of torment did he put these toys through? They were just coming back for revenge. They were coming Char- back for revenge. We know Charlemagne's a little freaky. Who, who knows what a young Charlemagne might have did with these little toys? Oh my God, though. Really. <laughs> 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 nah, I, I'm, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> I, I don't know if I want to picture that, but um, so his first, his first song that Charmin got, a hip hop song that he said that he heard, and this is a testimony to uh, how much, like, he was a little bit younger than yeah. me. I was surprised um, by that. Paid in Full, Paid in Full was his first song that he heard. I don't know why I was surprised, but I was surprised by that though. That that he was a little bit younger. No, not that he was a little bit younger, but that that's what he had that impact with. Cause I don't get that from him, especially not the music really? that. Yeah, not with the music that he claims to like nowadays. I think he's just someone who is because of his job, he has to jump on this young thing bandwagon. But I think originally he was like everybody else he loved the culture and like the kind of stuff that he was talking about he liked like mob deep wu-tang yeah i i didn't i didn't take him for that kind of person yeah i mean I what else for more of a, like? uh, well at the time yeah yeah but i pegged him for the type to be a pm Dawn fan what i did nah I, did. I would never think he was a. I would think he would like whatever was grimy. Grimy and Charlemagne don't go hand in hand for me. Yeah, they kind of do to me when I see him. He more of a Rockefeller. It would seem like that to me. He and he talks about he he drops a lot of um like quotes by like famous people like orators and mm-hmm. you know great at one point which we'll get to I guess later he he drops a a quote by Elvis and he says but like EPM like excuse me like um, public enemy fuck Elvis motherfucker <laughs> motherfucker Elvis yeah I was like why would you say Elvis's quote and then say motherfucker Elvis I don't get it but that, that to me is like because that's the contradictory life 
to me that Charlamagne he's like two things at What's once. His he's a cancer like I am. He's petty as hell. He knows it. Yeah. Is duplicity like that common? I said, is that kind of du- duplicity common amongst cancers? Not really. More, more Gemini's. I'll dispute that. <laughs> okay, um, you guys are the twin, and you're known for for being two. So I don't. Well, and I duplicity don't is about two two things. That's that's. Like that's I'm pretty point. straightforward. I'm pretty straightforward. All Gemini's don't have to be, but you know. Some of them are. Yeah, some of them. So, he talks about his upbringing. Talks about Sam Walton. I don't know why he picks people like Sam Walton, though. It could just be what he was exposed to. He was never exposed to that, I don't think, because it's just about money and but to me Walmart is like the epitome of everything that he should probably hate coming up in the city he grew up in I can see that I think he grew up in a really small town and if they have mom and pop businesses and stuff Walmart will come in and crush your shit wipe everything up when do when, hold on Let's see when Walmart found it though, because when did he leave Monk's Corner? I think that they were just getting a Walmart when, but you know, Charlemagne, for him to be in the industry and be around things, he doesn't. I don't know if he educates himself enough about a lot of things, like he says like, he does. I feel like oh, like he says he does. I don't know. That's I might feel a little different. I get I get the impression that he's still in the process. I think we all are, but I think he doesn't he's not as advanced as he at this point as he could be probably. As he lets on. As he lets on. I can agree to that as he lets on. But I think I, mean, I think I think he's like purposefully trying now. He was just what well, he does the brilliant idiots every week. Uh huh. And if he comes to his show He's getting exposure to other things. Well, you don't really need to read this book if you listen to a show every week because it's, <laughs> it's like that's the other thing is that I know Aaron. Do you still listen to his show, to his podcast? Um, sometimes. I just started. I've been binge watching. So, like listening to his show every every week, like he talks about most of the stuff he's talking about in his book. Yeah, he does. On air, yeah. Yeah, but I think he based um, most of his principles on those, you know, like, big business type folks. Like, he don't... Like, his foundation isn't based in the South, even though that's where he was raised. Well, yeah, but he does spend a good chunk of the early parts of the book talking about his inspiration or desire to want to leave Monk's Corner. He yeah. does. Yeah, that's what but but he goes back there to reconnect. He does say that that you have to yeah. go back to wherever you came from and and get yourself back right when things aren't lining up correctly, and then go back to where. So he says he still goes back to Monk Corner and to the trailer where his mom lives and goes in his own bedroom. I will agree to that. Like for me, going back down 15th from Clearfield or 19th from Venango or Denny Street is like reignites my initial desire to get out. Like, when I go down to my mom's house, like, there's a bunch of dudes on the block that's just sitting around, not doing nothing. Nobody wants to do anything. Like, everybody's happy with what they got going on right now, which ain't much. And, and I, he can't, I can't, that, I can't be around that kind of Yeah, see, he calls that what, what, what you're talking about, Anthony. He calls that guys under a tree. Yeah, it's pretty much. A tree, a porch, a stoop, whatever you yep. want to call it. Yep. Um, nice. So when you go home, Anthony, when you go back home and reconnect, is there a burnt plastic man on a tractor in the corner? <laughs> <laughs> there are no burnt plastic men. All the toys I had as a kid are gone, sadly. I had a couple like, that I had in my 
Farmer, like, Farmer Ted, I remember when I pulled you out of the fire because I heard you screaming. <laughs> I did have a Leonardo, a Leonardo stuffed teddy bear drone and Ninja Turtle ball that I roofed. And I oh, thought shit. I couldn't get him back down. I panicked. I was a young boy. Like, I'm like, yo, I can't get my... Like, I grew up. If you look at my baby pictures, it's me and Leonardo rocking out down there. That's hilarious. <laughs> I got him down, though. Hell yeah, I got him down. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, I got him down. I was right. That's what I mean. But, but <sighs> none of them actually spoke to me. <laughs> None of them. And, and you're 100 percent sure about that, right? I'm that's 100% right. 100 sure about that. None of that's them right. actually that's spoken. Right. Take it to your grave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was between us. No one will ever know. No, he was like, we were communicating telepathically. No words. <laughs> we connected on a different level. He <laughs> had to say nothing. I just knew by the Blake stare on his face, he got me. <laughs> <laughs> let, me let me find out. You be classic, man. <laughs> I'm fluid. I'm fluid. <laughs> so, principle two, he calls PYP, pick your passion, poison, or procrastination. Mm-hmm. He said passion equals prosperity, poison equals pain, and procrastination. Pretty much just leaves nowhere. Procrastination is my biggest enemy. And not to pick two or three because you need to follow your your passion instead of um just wasting your life away. He does talk about um oh he talks about William Bryant, William Jennings Bryan. That destiny is not a matter of chance; it's a matter of choice. He talks about hating dumb street names too like not naming anybody like dumb street but he loves 21 Savage again go figure yeah um, I, but again I haven't listened to much 21 Savage I will admit I don't but see stuff like that make me feel like he full of shit though like yeah, me too, Eric <laughs> <laughs> it might, like, like, he said it's sonically pleasing See, that's a whole different show because we'll be on that forever if we start talking about that. I don't understand. Right. It's hard to debate he, sonic confusing as an answer. What do you mean hard to debate? What What is Because I can always say sonically pleasing is relative. You can't uh, prove or disprove something as sonically pleasing. I can prove that person. if you find 21 Savage sonically pleasing, there's something wrong with your fucked up ears. I will agree to that, <laughs> but that still doesn't mean that it's not sonically pleasing to him. You can't prove but it, or disprove but it does, that. But, but it does mean that he ha- he lacks credibility now because you know that that right. shit is not sonically pleasing. I agree to that, and I agree that that's a bullshit answer. That's a media answer. Oh, yeah, But at the end of the day, when it comes to facts, like you can't prove or disprove that it's not sonically pleasing to him. Right. So this is the chapter where he starts getting bullied and his father does that whole thing with throwing him in with his cousin and basically, you know, teaches him to be obnoxious so he can survive instead of being a good student. He starts drinking 40 ounces and, you know, I think one of his friends or his cousin or whatever becomes a full-blown alcoholic. Yeah, and then he has he has to go to the middle school version of AA. I didn't realize that was a thing. It's yeah, me neither. Shit. And then his dad didn't pay for summer school at first. Well, he paid for the first time when he was in seventh grade. Now he goes from being this super smart kid to. Like flunking out of seventh or like flunking seventh grade and having to repeat it, and then flunking eighth grade and having to repeat that too. Mostly all because his because behind the stuff his dad did. Cause then, I don't understand why his mother he said his mother didn't really. I think it's because his parents were having problems. There's a lot that's hinted at 
in like the silence and his mother's character. Well, yeah, character is a book now, so you can say character. And his mother's character, like his dad, plays a bigger part in the early parts of the book than his mother does, who seems to be the better influence. Right. See, but that's the point I was trying to make about that extreme parenting from one parent versus another. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask if you think like the fact that he was raised in a Jehovah Witness household plays a part in his writing style. How do Jehovah Witnesses write? Like, right. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Not, 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 not about writing, but the way the way that they live. Like, aren't isn't isn't it like a thing where it's like the man is the head of the household, the woman don't have much authority? And I that's what I was thinking that not just that, but they're southern too. Yeah, true. In southern culture, that's a big thing too. And like I feel like maybe there is a lot that his mom actually did that he might have overlooked or just left out of the book because in terms of importance things i want to keep for for shortening the book things i want to cut out things that don't necessarily need to be told he might have chosen to left out leave out just because his mom was a woman it's like but i wonder even if, if he's a conscious like, does he, i mean does but at the risk of making her look extremely passive and just not there in his life Maybe that's what it looks like. protecting her image or subconsciously neglecting that, neglecting to accept that for what it was because the woman's position is so pacified. It's like not even yeah. significant. That's true. So he said that, he said, he talked about that on the Breakfast Club too, about like how, how he like, you know, he had to come to the realization that he's oblivious to like, you know, his um treatment of women or like, you know, that kind of, uh that kind of, um, I miss the episode. <laughs> yeah. I miss the episode. That's crazy. Wow. I just blew my whole mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, that's a little bit that that was probably the most disturbing thing in the book for me. Is what you guys are talking about now. I would love to see Michael Eric Dyson's take on Charlemagne the God's first book. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I want to I'm gonna ask him that if I ever get a chance. <laughs> yeah, I can so, see him. I can see him uh, talking about it right now while he nodding his head and shit, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> principle number three is fuck your dreams fuck and your dreams. fuck your dreams. And so he's talking about um, a lot of stuff in that chapter. He talks about. Um, this is when he started veering away from all that crime and stuff. This was after him and his father wound up in jail together that night. He was selling <laughs> he was selling dope and stuff in high school and he got kicked out of his first high school and then he went to the second high school and he was chasing and he got a gun charge almost. He beat most of his charges. I don't think he spent that time in the county because his father made him stay there. Yeah, they didn't pay bail. But so in Fuck Your Dreams, he figures out, he looks at his cousins, the ones who have been beating him up or whatever. Mm-hmm. But th- they started liking him when he was being a thug, apparently. But then he started moving to the point, like like moving away from that shit. Like, he's, I don't want to wind up like them because they were both crackheads, weren't they? Yeah. He he makes it known that that's where he eventually ends up in this chapter, but he draws out that transition longer than I thought he needed to. I think so too. But so then he he starts talking about um, how he got into radio. Basically, yeah. at first he wanted to be a rapper. His rap name, Rachel, <laughs> everyone, is Dizzy Van Winkle. <laughs> 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 and there was a local label named um, TNT Records, and then that got busted, so he never wound up there. Um, but then is that the same TNT Records I think of when I hear TNT Records? I don't think so. I Maybe? was confused at that. I was confused at that point. Well, remember they got busted by the Fed, so you probably never heard of that. I don't know. How would you have heard yeah. of that? No, TNT, ain't TNT, like, connected to, uh, like, Mass P and them? No, 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 no. Master P? TNT, TNT Records is a thing, ain't it? 
Master P was not T and T Records. No, I'm, I'm saying like connected, like affiliated or. Oh. Um, I don't know why. I don't think so. I'm googling it right now. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna. Yeah. So anyway, he wound up as an intern. Now this is the part where the of the book where he does kind of give he gives good advice. He's talking about working hard for no money. And he talks about that at several t- different times in the book, working hard for no money and how people basically of you guys' generation, like the younger ones and the ones after that, need to basically stop with all of this. I'm going to get everything instantly and learn how to be humble and work hard. I, yeah, I that's, that's, yeah, but this is one of the parts of the book I feel like was uh, kind of um, could be taken out of context depending on who's reading it. That, that point right there specifically, that point right there specifically, I can relate to that because I went through this program and the last week of the program, you got stuck with an internship. It was either paid or it wasn't. If I didn't do that internship and it was non-paid, I wouldn't be where I am right now. So I can relate to that right there. I took a hit those four months. Right. But it paid off. Yeah. So I can relate to that. Well, he was yeah, talking but... about. Oh. No, Hello? I was saying, but he does, but but um, he doesn't like go into context about like you know like you can't just tell somebody oh you know if you work for free you know you you bound to run into some opportunities like it doesn't just work like that like you got to recognize yeah. the opportunities. And, yeah, everything you know, ain't good. Well, no, <laughs> yeah, ain't good you, I mean, you have to recognize the opportunity. He's right. But what he's saying is everything is not going to happen for you overnight. And sometimes if you want to get somewhere, especially in the area that he's working in, you have to start out as an intern if you want to start where he is, really. Yeah, yeah exactly. But a, a lot, that's going to be you're not getting paid. Like, same thing that Angie said in her book. And she said the same thing. She was like, she you're going right. to have to work hard. And she's like, there isn't anything. She said, you're supposed to work hard. So you're supposed to work until you bleed. And then you're supposed to work some more. And, and she and also she like, got coffee, too. She got coffee, too. I thought that was cool that she put that in there. Because there's people out there that go and get coffee. And, like, people like me. <laughs> me and my coworkers, you said, I would never get a motherfucker's coffee. You serious? It depends no. on where I was. Yeah, and my, and you like you like I don't do that shit now. But no, I would I would never. Are you but, it, but when I was when I was younger, when I was younger and I was starting out, like when I was young, young, I I mean I was like nineteen. Yeah, I worked. Yeah, I thought that was cool that she mentioned that. But um, so Dizzy Van Winkle. <laughs> work <laughs> work that was interning at Z ninety three jams and then this dude named Doc Doctor Evans was was cool with him and then that's how he wound up. He basically told him to stop fucking around trying to be a rapper and he told him that his being on the radio was what he needed to do. He sounds like a very interesting person. Maybe Doctor Evans should have wrote a- <laughs> so okay, so like principal. So principal four, there are no losses, only lessons. He's talking about when he basically um, lost his job, and he talked about he wound up on Wendy Williams' the show. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> are you gonna give up what? Which Yeah, he wound up on because well he worked he wound up getting a radio position. He went through several radio positions and he wound up getting one um in Charleston in the bigger city of South Carolina. And and so Wendy became syndicated there. And but then I think the locals were pissed off about that. 
And so they moved the show around because it was on the afternoon. They like moved it to the nighttime. And then I think the local radio DJ who was pissed about it was making sure that only that same episode got repeated over and over again. (laughs) And they weren't playing it. So Kevin, her husband, Kevin came on the air and was ranting and he Charlamagne allowed him to do it, so him and Charlamagne kind of got cool, and they be, and he wound up working for Wendy for free. They gave him a place to crash, mm-hmm. and he only made money through parties, like throwing you know hosting parties on the weekends. But he kept his old job during the week, and he worked on Wendy Williams' show for two years, or what? Well, no, like I think a year and a half with no money. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know that before, but I mean, like you said, I found that out from listening to his other stuff, his podcast and whatnot. So it's kind of relevant to read it it in the book. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, you know, I mean, he does talk about, but he talks about, he says some mean, he says some nice things about Wendy and he says some mean shit about Wendy. Wendy earns all of it. But, you know, that she doesn't treat people, but we'll talk about her in a little in a second. Cause is Wendy Williams Suge Knight? <laughs> you know what? I keep wanting to wonder. Is she Suge Knight? He said, "Is it Suge Knight oh, in a blonde wig and a dress?" Is what he said. Hey, yeah. <laughs> I can't believe you. <laughs> so principle number five is put the weed in the bag, and that everyone is a reference. To the movie Billy. Put the weed in the bag. This boy can name a chapter. I'll give him that. Put the weed in the bag. Basically, he Put said opportunity comes before money in general. Like, you're not going to be making no big money. You got to hustle. But see, I agree with that. And I feel like there's too many people. He's like, you know, you're on social media. He talks about social media really badly on this one. Or not badly, but he talks about it a lot saying that. Just because you're on social media does not mean you're about to a whole, like blow up and get a whole bunch of money tomorrow. Uh-huh. Right. People been on there for years. Shout out to Issa Rae. Yo, I love Issa Rae. What? <laughs> 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 but he was, you know. HBO. I mean, it's possible today, but you still got to work. You still got to hump and put your time in. Incredible the hustle. Bond. Um, principle six, live your truth. And that's, um, that's where he quotes Chuck D. Well, he quotes Elvis Presley and then, and then brings in fight the power. He talks shit about his dick size. (laughs) I don't know where that came in at, but. Right. It sounds about right for him though. (laughs) It was bound to happen. He talks about his eight mile theory. Which is getting out in front of your insecurities. So, if you if you take your insecurities and flip them the other way on people, like like he did in the battle where he talked about everything and he already knew the other guy was going to talk about against him. Yeah, right. Then he said you you take the venom and the sting out of out of it for people, and then people actually appreciate you being honest and candid about that kind of stuff too. Yeah, I don't think I even got that far in the book. But basically, it seemed like most of what he's talking about is stuff that you hear him talk about on the show all the time anyway. Same thing I said. Yeah. So, principle number seven, quickly going through the rest of them. Give people the credit they deserve for being stupid. <laughs> um, Can I do with that? And he talks about his daughter and her... Oh, he talks about the whole concept of not having any new friends. Like the whole song by uh, what's the name? No new friends. Uh-huh. He like he said you can't learn new things if you never have new friends. Like so, what the fuck is that about? I don't know if everybody's like, supposed to be a friend though. Everybody's not supposed to be your friend. You can take each account and learn from another individual, but they don't have to be a friend. Yeah, see, but I think see that's what I'm saying. Like people like 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 us might understand that you know what i'm saying and um some people that's listening might understand that but like everybody you know might not get that that's what he means exactly yeah. like they don't have to they don't have to be like close friends or something but you have to um involve yourself with different people or new people to 
to um, yep. get into the at, at least be open to those encounters. And right. that's what he's saying. You definitely have to yeah. be like you have to do that, or you're not going to change or grow or evolve. And and if you don't do that, you're going to be dude under a tree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. He does talk about in that chapter. He talked about Lauren Hill's X Factor and how he likes to discredit Lauren Hill when he's talking about her. She only had one album. But he says he only does that because his mother played the X Factor song so much, and he thinks it's because that she never got over their their mom and his um their the mom and dad's divorce. He did say his dad <laughs> said that divorcing his mom was the worst thing, the the like the dumbest thing he ever did. But that, that he I guess he should. But he's he's remarried now to the woman that he was cheating on her with. But he had a whole outside family on them. Yeah. I think a lot of the stuff that, that happened with his parents really psychologically did. That's why I say that's why I say I'm glad he's talking to a therapist. Yeah. So yeah. principle eight was the last one. Access your black privilege. And then of course he talks there. He talks about some of the five percent of nation teachings that he learned when he was younger. Um and there's a whole lot of stuff about hip hop in the book too that just like goes in and out. Hip hop was a large influence on him too. But yeah, I kind of agree with you guys. Like overall, I think probably already doing or half the things that he like. We're doing what we wanted to write right now as do this class. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not only is it. It's not we're not getting money from it. We're putting money into it. Yeah, pretty much. Because we just love to do it. Sometimes you just do, you know, like like I said, you do. You follow your truth. You follow your dopeness. You do what you're supposed to do, and all that other stuff just. Right. That's probably that's probably like the that's probably like the um. The, the best message out of his book that uh PYP what was that uh something yeah. uh, your passion your poison pain or your poison passion yeah yeah passion. and um yeah because like that's well, you know, Bobby that's, and Ricky. I don't know hold on let me see Which <laughs> <one>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah because like that's I think that's the issue for most people like most people you know they just want to people want to be successful but they don't know what they want to be successful at like i was watching an interview with um jay-z and jay-z was talking about that he was saying like he think he feel like he's successful in what he does because stuff that he's involved in is stuff that he grew up around all his life and he knows about it and he's passionate about it yeah yep. i was well, saying too, like, do whatever know. is making them money they don't they don't they don't want to follow Cause he was talking about everybody is not going to be a rapper. Everybody's not going to be a, in sports. Right. Figure out something right. else. That's why I was right. saying, like, even even though, like, you you got to watch that interview with the Bevel dude. They bring up a point where it's like everybody in the hood they think their only way out is entertainment or sports, and then like the stock market and then entrepreneurship. When there needs to be a flip on that. Well, I, know, I think I was talking to a friend of mine. Well, my friend, he's an he's a, um, engineer. And he was saying, like, he was, like, drawing cars. Or something. And, like, we're from Detroit. So, there were, yeah. you know, the, the three different auto um, industries were, were there. Especially at that time, it was still prevalent there. And he was drawing pictures. And somebody was telling him, oh, why are you always drawing pictures? Where someone else encouraged him because they finally were telling him, like, yo, like, this shit is dope. You can be an engineer. You can do drafting. You can do people have, but people have to tell you if that shit is possible for you and put you on a path to do that. Somebody Mm -hmm. as as an adult has to see that in you and know where to direct you. And even better, somebody that did that for themselves. But how many people in the hood are, is, are going to be that person though, aunt? That's the sad part. It is. So, it's lunchtime. Hold on, hold on. One thing, one thing. That's why I was saying, like, I hope more people take from this the fact that he likes to read. Like, go out and grab a book. Yeah, read. Even definitely. if you download that genre, like, read something 
experience something outside of your norm, like expand your horizons a little bit. Just a little and, bit. And he did say that too. He focused on um, being able to read things outside of your norm. So again, hood books don't really fit into that. <laughs> Zane is bad for the culture. <laughs> I'm not saying you can't read Zane, but if you're going to read Zane, then go read, um, also go read Huck Finn or something. You know, read I something care, I else. Care what it is, where you start, whatever it is, read something. read something. I need you to balance your reading out because he did that. He did focus on. He didn't just say go read any old book. You know, I want to. I want to try to read any old book. Hold on, hold on. When you read one thing and you get into it, then you get that that hunger get ignited. You gonna grab whatever you can. I don't know. It depends on who you are, but like you do need to be exposed to different things yeah. that take you outside of your comfort zone. Right. Exactly. You're never going exactly. to grow if you don't challenge yourself. Exactly. That's 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 all I'm getting at. That's all I'm getting at. Even if it's like a murder mystery, a detective John, a science fiction John, whatever. Right, something. Okay, something. so we gotta go to um, we gotta go to lunch now. <laughs> and I think we um I think we came to a consensus that <laughs> that the person who's getting donkey the day to day. Aaron? <laughs> Aaron, who is it? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Wendy Williams. <laughs> I, we need an audio Whitaker for this person. She's more of a gentleman than a lady, though. <laughs> <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> That's a man, baby. <laughs> we need an audio <laughs> Whitaker. Audio Whitaker. We need a Forrest Whitaker quote right here. I don't even know where to start with her. <laughs> no, it's so many things. She's just... She's, first of all, she's in both books basically being trashed. Both to books. From people on opposite ends of the spectrum. But they, but they, you would expect them to talk both talk about her because they're both ready on air radio personalities. So they've all, so they've all crossed one of those paths because um, they've all been in New York and they've all done this job in New York. So it makes sense. It does. But the fact that they agree on this one thing <laughs> <laughs> that says a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, they, agree really they agree on education and stuff. <laughs> and this, one, this one thing stands out. This stands out right They're here. like, Wendy Williams there. <laughs> <laughs> Insert impending doom. Somebody hit impending doom. No! <laughs> That's the puppy button. Oh, damn, I said puppy. But see, like... <laughs> there has to be there has to be the, the counterpart to that. Like there has to be a female. Okay, we gotta get turns. a Wendy Williams button that should be. You the boo button. Cause Wendy is Wendy throws. Woo. Yeah, but no, nah, she definitely in the way, like and you know what I'm saying? Like for all the reasons that, you know, everybody, even people that listen already know why, like, you know, just being a instigator for for most of the things that's going on in the hip hop culture, mm-hmm. and she's been at that a long time. But I will Let say, I will you. say, I will say, shout out to Vince Staples. Wendy Williams is for the culture. Oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> no, <laughs> I can't even believe you said either of those two things. Shout out to Vince Staples. Wendy you Williams just threw the all the culture vultures <laughs> like right in a bucket and just was like, "Yep, Vince Staples." That just helps to illustrate my point. So Wendy academics are there the with them and Wendy Williams. They're all for the culture. Um, yep. And Joe yep. Button, I'm mad at you, bro. I'm mad at Joe Button. Why are you pissed at Joe Button today? He didn't check. He didn't check Ben Staples when he asked what the culture is. <sighs> like he he mentioned the elements, but he kind of whispered it like the kid in the back of the room that don't want to get noticed. Or like little Yachty, who someone's telling with a wind with, well, um, a woodwind instrument in his ear. 
I'm still scared to get my best because I was busting it on half the last show. That shit was hilarious. That shit was, I like Lottie. I like Yachty because of that video. <laughs> he ain't got to put out no albums. I'm cool. Stop. Don't go to the studio. Just do videos. What's bad is, like, <laughs> what's bad is, like, either one of them is, like, even as close as bad as, as close as being as bad as um, uh, Wendy Williams is. Yeah, Wendy. she's pretty. She's she's pretty. She's bad. Yeah. She's just nice. she 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 is a troll before trolling was trolling. Uh huh. She, she, she was a troll. The prototype. Yeah. <laughs> she's the original troll. She ain't no she ain't no vulture. She's sharp. Right. Right she just it. she does shit for sens- um for um sensationalism only and for ratings and for money. But it works. Just, I mean, it does. And when we go into the next book, you'll hear her. But like mm. Angie Martinez got into a fight with this chick. Like I, I forgot about what that. What you gonna though. do with that mop? What you gonna do with that mop? <laughs> <laughs> What's crazy to me about Wendy Williams though is how nonchalant she is about like the live she affected with this propaganda she dropped. Like, oh, she doesn't give a shit about anything. She that's don't probably that's my problem really. with all those people. That's my problem. With- Every time Angie would ask her, Yo, Wendy, what are you doing? Stop doing this shit. And she'd be like, um, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. It's that kind that's of thing. Like, like, but that's why somebody would punch you in your fucking face, and that's why you got punched in the face. Because <laughs> shit like that. You can't be doing that and not think you're not going to get punched in the face. Like academics, eventually somebody is going to corner you and punch you in your fucking face, dude. I'm concerned it's gonna be somebody from Chicago. I am too. <laughs> Look, Agony seriously. Additional security. People Academic. Used to die. Additional People security. have died. People have died, man. People yeah. have already died. Stop putting yourself in a position to, for somebody to crack your cabbage, as we say. <laughs> no, no cabbage. No cabbages need to be cracked behind that shit. Then you better tell your boy AK and people like Wendy Williams. But Wendy Williams has slowed down a little bit. Yeah, thankfully. She'll I think he slowed down. Though. She slowed down in certain arenas. Like she still, she still go hard on certain celebrities and stuff. I mean, she's still expected to fill a certain lane. Yeah. yeah. Even on TV. Yeah. Yeah, but, but they she pick and she, she pick and choose who she do that shit to now. I guess it's, I guess it depends on her platform too. Like her platform, the platform she got now ain't really built for like you know the hip hop audience. It's not. So. It's not. Would so you say that's her main know. platform now? She talks about that stuff, but she's messy about everybody and everything. But she doesn't have like Aaron said. She's on television now, so she has a wider audience. Right. Yeah. Like television ain't for hip hop, so. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's yeah, weird. Cause Charlamagne the guy talked about how much he hated um those hip hop shows too. He said he calls um Mona, he calls her Satan. Yeah, he calls mm-hmm. her Satan. Oh, oh wow. Mona Scott, he calls her Satan Scott. Wow. Like, you know what? <laughs> because I mean, he said that shit is poison, which I don't disagree. It's just that Charlamagne is like. Charlemagne to me is just like Wendy because we almost gave Charlemagne out to lunch today, but uh, yeah. but I mean he worked with her so it, it makes sense that they are similar. They're both mm-hmm. messy as hell, but he's like he, he has selective niggardry, and that's <laughs> it. <laughs> it like, right? Yeah. Is that's <laughs> Wait, can we copyright that? <laughs> <laughs> Damn, that rolls off the tongue. But Charlamagne I mean, Wendy has nigger. the same thing. Wendy is the same way. She's like selectively yeah. niggerish. But do you think that's why the hood likes them? I think so. You don't have that's to be ghetto brand. or a hood. She is not ghetto. She was raised no, in the suburbs of New Jersey. But you gotta have selective niggerish. <laughs> you don't have to be. 
hood to be niggerish. How does yeah. one obtain selective nigger G? <laughs> we don't want to obtain that shit. We want to make sure we don't catch it. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to do it. I think Wendy, I think Wendy, uh, <laughs> one of those. <laughs> I think she's one of those personalities that realized that people love to have somebody they hate. So she was like, fuck it, I'm gonna just run with it. I feel like that's her base personality too, though. But yeah. see, her and her, Charlamagne the God are exactly the same, though. They're both like that. Mm, I can see that. Like, like all the love that Angie gets, like that's the opposite of what both of them get. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because they want to be, quote-unquote, provocative. Mm-hmm. I think you can do that without being an ass hat. <laughs> <laughs> but Charlamagne, I will say, Charlamagne is a likable ass hat. People like him a little more than they like Wendy. Yeah. Yeah, I'll this ass hat today. <laughs> Charlamagne well, is a likable mean, ass hat. Not watching him with all those women. And when we watched him with all those women those on that clip that day. That Don't shit was uncomfortable. Yeah, I needed, I needed an adult. I needed an adult. I needed several adults. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That yeah. was some. Uh, see, he's he's. That's what I mean. Selectively niggerish. That's that's some cancer reason, shit he was doing. Another reason why I'm glad he's speaking to a therapist. <clears throat> I hope the therapist helps him with that shit then. Because Charlemagne could be good for the culture if. He sh- he tightened up in certain areas. And so he, he got the audience. Twenty one savage. <laughs> he got the audience, and I'm reluctant to say he got the star power because of our previous conversation. <laughs> he does. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but he. <laughs> I'm not he, even he touching that with a ten foot <laughs> mop handle. I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's another. That's another episode. That's another episode. But 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 he got the audience. He got the, he got the star power to, to actually be good for the culture. If he has something productive, something constructive to say, without being an ass hat about it. We don't need a million ass hats out here. Good luck with that, with him and Wendy. And it's back from lunch. Because <laughs> we got to get this book done. So, can, we, can, we, can we have a star power episode? <laughs> no, Anthony, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, you wildin'. <laughs> you know what, though, no. Aaron? He's the one that said it. That's that's funny as shit. <laughs> it's in his book, oh, Aaron. Man. He wait, said it. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For everybody who doesn't know, because you haven't read it, Charlemagne has a part in the book where he talks about how if everybody is supposedly sucking dick, excuse my French, to get on. <laughs> Then, 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 you know, and everybody would be Will Smith if that was the case. Unless Will Smith just got some super ass head game. Allegedly. 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 Allegedly Allegedly over this whole conversation. (laughs) He put it in his book. He said that shit. Not not us. So, so, back to Sainer books that are not this book. Off to more calm, insane books that are not this, not black privilege. We have Angie Martinez, My Voice, a memoir. So, um, so first part of her book, her book separates into like three different sections. Well, she has the intro, where the intro was dope to me. What do you guys yeah. think about the intro? What did you drink at? I dug it. I thought it was fly. I, I, I didn't know J. Cole had that kind of relationship with Angie Martinez. She has, she's liked by everybody. She's the opposite of both yeah. Wendy Williams and Charlotte Bates, the guy. Yeah. I thought that was dope. That was cool. That was fly. But I like Any how. Way she, executed it too. Yeah. I like oh, how. Oh, how it, it it talked about what hip hop used to be 
and how it used to just be raw and it was unafraid and it, it was just unashamed and it was and how everything has now flipped the opposite mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. it's everything uh, we it, always talk about it made me miss being able to listen to the radio yeah I like that uh, but she separates her book into three sections like on a timeline so the first part is finding the mic um, 1971 to 1997 any standouts in that part of the book for you guys I thought it was just interesting to see how she got her start and all that. Yeah, it it almost it almost felt like she um fell into um the radio world just because of who her mom was. But she 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 put like an emphasis on her general interest in it too. She didn't have a general interest. She had she was in love with the culture. Right. Yeah. yeah. She dove in. Yeah, but that's what I, that's what I, it seemed like you know like she was like it's um it's like we just got done talking about like you know like having a passion for a certain thing and um i feel like you know it was one of those things where you know she just happened to be a b girl a hip-hop fan and it was like you know what was you know i'm saying it's like what's going to be my outlet oh okay radio it was that kind of thing she was on the front front um her mother worked had worked at radio stations all the time and um her mother was was integral in in helping her get an internship in in fact her both both her internships her she that she was at high 97 because of her mother right and you said it was a dance station back then at first, yeah, when she went there. But she was in Florida at first. She was in yeah. Florida at first at that station. She hated it. She didn't... I think she just embraced Florida, but she didn't... Because Florida... Cause she was, remember she was talking about Florida hip-hop? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All that it wasn't Miami the, face. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the same. I, I was like Uncle Luke. <laughs> mm-hmm. But don't stop giving... That song wasn't out at that particular time, but you know, but um, throw that D was out and <laughs> stuff like that during that time. I found right. it interesting that she was actually she actually missed the whole Afrocentric movement of hip hop because she, she was in Miami. That. Well, yeah. she did she did mention it because remember you basically would have had to just kind of glean it from what she was saying because she had been skipping school and her mother sent her down to Miami and to get her mm-hmm. shit together. And then her mom went down there too. But be, and then she started skipping school again. Her mom slapped the shit out of her. <laughs> <laughs> she said her mom had Yeah, she said, all I she said, that's all I needed. And I was good. So, um, she did not advocate child abuse, but she was like, she said, every once in a while, sometimes mm-hmm. you need to shit knocked out of you. Because you, you just got to get your sis back. But she got it together. She graduated, and then she went to the internship. And she was talking about how she was in Miami when um, Bonita Applebaum came out and El Segundo. That's that was that's oh. that's Q-tip in a tribe called Quest, and that was at the height of the Afrocentricity. So if right. she was in Miami during that time, she missed all of that. I, I laughed out loud at that part. What? When she said, um, "I might not have understood the meaning of I left my wallet in El Segundo," because <laughs> that's how I felt when I first heard it too. I'm like, "What the hell are these niggas talking about?" So. <laughs> No, El Segundo is actually in California. Uh-huh. Yeah. I passed through El Segundo when I was there last week. It's not. Did it's you leave like your not, wallet? I did not leave my wallet. I would have left oh. my wallet on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you take everything out. Uh, let me get my ID. So I'm leaving my wallet at El Segundo on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, that's funny. But now her first song that she heard, she's closer to my age. The first song she heard that made her fall in love with hip hop was um, Rapper's Delight, which makes sense. Right. A lot more sense. And then she said when she heard, when she first heard Rakim for the first time, then that shit changed everything. And it did for everybody. She said it just made you feel like that shit was serious business she, now. She, she knew it was real. She knew it was real. Yep. Top five better alive, Rakim Alive. You in the top five better alive. Top five better alive. <laughs> I mean it. So, so when she, so she went back to it. NYC with her mom. Her mom told her she would have an internship, or she would get her an internship, but she had to promise to go to college. And she was in college for like a hot second. My man, they both had that. that, but her and Charlemagne both did that. Charlemagne was there for a day, a half a day, and left. Mm-hmm. And Angie was there for like maybe a semester or something she said like so so I um, what do you guys think about that as far as like both of those books that are kind of giving you a subliminal message about school maybe college ain't for everybody institutionalized education is a problem there's a problem somewhere along the lines in terms of the system and the way it works education is a beautiful thing but institutionalized education is a problem I mean, yeah, but do you think that everybody is gonna? Oh, go ahead, Aaron. Go ahead. No, um, I was just um going off of what um Anthony was just saying. Like, uh, I I kind of agree with that because it seemed like um a lot of times, especially nowadays, like people just go to college because that's the you know that's, that's what's expected of. Yeah, yeah, like that's what's expected of them. Like, and you know they go in with no real um focus on what they want to do, and I don't think that's healthy a lot of. Because a lot of times, you know, when people don't know, it, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like some people go in there, they don't know what they want to do, then they figure it out. Maybe like the second, third semester or something like that. But um, I don't think it's healthy to um, go into um, uh, college, you know, just thinking, oh, everything gonna work out because I'm in college now, you know. And I think that's what a lot of people. I think that's how a lot of people jump into it. I feel like it's a good social experience too, though. Like. College and, it, and just school, school in general, institutional. Like being in a room with thirty-two other motherfuckers helps you deal with society in a healthy way. It does. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it does help you formulate. Like it, I didn't have my opinions challenged until I went right. to college. Yeah, challenged in an intelligent way. <laughs> and I was, I was getting ready to say because you're not gonna get on the internet. <laughs> And get your opinions challenged in a healthy way on a, on YouTube. Right. right. You need right. to be and in I a university or a or a collegiate setting for that shit to happen. At least right. where people yeah. read like a comic book store or something. I don't care what you read. And, like come something on, something where somebody is doing something intelligently and not a bunch of effective ass niggerish people. You know, don't tell me you don't like something. Tell me why you don't like it. Explain that to me why you don't like it. That's my biggest fucking pet peeve ever. <laughs> I know you don't like it, but tell me why. Because everybody nothing else don't like it. it. That's not a Look, reasonable explanation. And see, that's my point is nothing and no one will give you a bogus ass explanation for not liking shit like the selectively niggerish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bravo. They love bravo. That shit. They love it. Bravo. Round of they applause. love being <laughs> mediocre and giving you dumbass answers. I can't stand dumbass answers. Don't tell me you don't like. Don't tell me you like Twenty One Savage because he's sonically pleasing. Don't That's tell me you know, that, that you like Twenty One Savage because you don't like Twenty Two Savage. Someone <laughs> told me that. <laughs> The fact that 22 uh, Savage exists is a red flag in itself. But how is that a fucking answer? Press the eject button on hip hop right now. We need to start over. I can't. But she did. Start. She worked really hard at her internship. And just like we were talking about earlier about Charlemagne, they were talking about how, you, you know, you in the beginning, you're going to work hard and you're going to get paid not at all or very little and you you just kind of have to 
You need hustle to hustle. You need to hustle. Yeah, I think it's. I think it is good that both of them talked about that too. Yeah, I agree. Because um, yeah, because um, of uh, like the way the way people are now, like they don't see that as a factor, like actually working hard to get somewhere. You know, like they see, like we uh, we see all this, we see all this bogus ass overnight celebrityism nowadays. So. YouTube well, generation. because of, because of social media, but you gotta remember, anything you get quickly will be fleeting. Yeah. yeah, but a lot of times, a lot of times, even people that we, you know, we assume that oh, they just like overnight celebrities on social media. A lot of times, they not like they put in, put in, you yep. know, what I'm saying a decent amount, a decent amount of work, if not the hardest work. They put in a decent amount of work to get their following. I feel yep. like um, DJ Mustard was just talking about that on Everyday Struggle. What he said, like every three or four years, you gotta redefine your sound because the the wave changes like every three or four years. And like I said in previous episodes, that time span is changing. Like it was every five to ten years before. Now it was every like three to four years. years, and mm-hmm. now it's gonna be like every six months. <laughs> that right there, that's some <laughs> bullshit right there. I'm sorry. I mean, we need an intervention. The country needs a fucking intervention, yo. <laughs> So, um, so the the station that we were in, Aunt Aunt just said it earlier. She was at an all like dance music station at first, yeah. which was Hot ninety seven in New York, and she stayed there and was working. And then they changed the format. They were such like changing the format to all hip hop. While she was there, like she just happened to be there, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. I believe in fate. So, nah. yeah, that was a W you know, for her. She was there w. when that when they were changing the format to all hip hop, which is right up her fucking alley. And she had just right. like learned how to like work the boards, and she, you know, didn't know how to work the board. She just pretended she did, and then dude kind of helped her. Yo, I, I was I was wondering it. that I was wondering <laughs> that like re- reading that part. I, I, really myself, story, yeah. I was thinking to myself, did um, did her and uh, Funk Flex, did they realize that you know um, oh, that man. was going to that that was going to be you know what I'm saying as big as it was when they got there? No, well, he was already was there, like and, then they, and then they hired him. Remember, they hired him, yeah. Yeah. and she was already there, and she saw him coming in like to even to get interviewed, and then they hired him, and she was like, "Oh, this shit is for real. They really getting yeah. ready to do this," because she saw him. At like when she used to go hang out at at like the tunnel and um like and this book is full of like name and place droppings like like when I like back in the nineties when I was trying to move to New York because I wanted to be involved in everything she was talking about like yeah. all that shit like she everybody funk master flex in the tunnel and she Lance on Rivera and she's talking about Salah Remy may he rest in peace and wait Salah Remy died. Wait a minute, wrong person. I'm sorry. Oh my God, you scared so, me. Don't do that. <laughs> why did I say that? I was, I was thinking oh heavy D in my head. Sorry, no. Salami is not dead. Heavy D is passed away. Sorry. Wait a minute. No, no, no. No, he's not dead. That, that was oh, me misspeaking because heavy D is dead. I'm sorry. I associate those two together and he's, he's passed away. As okay, so. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Salamari is not dead, everybody. That was me. That was a faux pas. Uh, so, when she, they went full hip hop and they were like, okay, you want to do a show? And she was like, what? <laughs> I like that part. That part. So, she, I mean, she started, and she was humping at that point because she had. When she first started, she was doing the boards for Flex from yeah. 10 to 2. She said she was doing it incognito, though. And like then she, she was do... supposed to be there. Well, no, she was. She was She was scheduled to do his boards from 10 to 2. And then she did her show from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Can you imagine doing that? Yeah. Long oh, shift. no. <laughs> Long shift. But she was hungry. Yeah. Right. And she was young. She was like in her, I don't even know if she was 20 yet. She might have been 19, 20. You're young then, and it's just you're hungry. It's what you yeah. want. So you're going to well, work hard for see, it. All right. So she did that. She did the um, Funk Flex John from uh, 10 to 2, right? He worked his, his boards, yeah. 
and that was that was ten to two, and then her joint was two to six. Yep, every day. The, the graveyard shit. Yep. Oh, Yep. Yeah, the graveyard shit. And then That's one day. Like that van story. What van story? When when she had to take uh, one of the other personalities to Great Adventure. Oh yeah, that was just. But that's yeah, that was from before when they changed the format. Yeah. When I don't she, know, um, was, that was, was it? What? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. But she almost got she, fired. She did, but she stuck up for herself. Yeah. What's she gets to do? Uh, topic of the book. Yeah. Well, then she yeah. started dating Q-Tip. Q-Tip called her on the show when she was... <laughs> He's moved for that. <laughs> I was like, what? Okay. He called her at 4.37 a.m. on a Thursday night. <laughs> yep. <laughs> or Thursday morning was like, hey, how you doing? Uh-huh. He moved that. She was like, huh? <laughs> 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 yeah, but all yeah. those like a lot of a lot of those stories was dope to me because like it seemed like everybody was in like the prime of their career like yeah. as far as as far as whatever as far as like being a rapper producer radio personality like everybody was in the prime of their career and they were just doing their thing and they just happened to all have these connections. But I had I had like a small memory for each of those stories too, like a small memory of what I was doing at the time. Well, and uh, what, what were you doing? Because this was like early nine, like early nineties. Where you did you I have your kid. diaper? On? I was a kid. Life was good. <laughs> I mean, she had well, she had Biggie because like she kind of like she kind of broke Jay Z out yeah. because she she had him on Battle of the Beats. That was her legendary. And, and like I'm saying, like I can, I can remember what I was doing when Takeover came out, and she was talking about how she first listened to Takeover and all that. And yeah. As a whole, like I can remember what I was doing when Takeover came out, and then Super Ugly and Easter and all that. Like those stories was like a fresh memory for me, like a memory. Well, uh, simple she, time, she, simple she time. interviewed Biggie and Nas and Wu Tang and Black Moon and Mob Deep and. Like all all the ones that that were coming up big in the '90s, like for the transition, she interviewed all of them, and everybody just her show blew up. Right, like, she became but a see, staple. What see, but that's what I'm saying. Like that's kind of like reading her story was kind of it's just kind of like you know it was kind of it was almost depressing because like it just had you realize <laughs> it that was it was gone. It yeah, that we don't. Gone. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. all that. Yeah, that is none of that energy anymore. Like the closest yeah, thing we nope. got to that is the bre- is the Breakfast Club, and it's not even the same thing. Nope. It did it's make me same. sad too because you guys were kids. I was. I lived through in that. It. You was in it. You was in it. We caught the tail end of it. In it. It was like. Yeah, we, so called then, tell, we called the tell in, but we still even even though we still had it, you know what I'm saying, a certain type of it was that type of ear to the street type of vibe. Like yeah, to come up to like I remember I remember listening to the come right. up show yeah, watching Rap City and all of that <laughs> and like, you know, just hearing like One Yeah, second. all that type of stuff and like we don't have any of that stuff anymore. This shit nope. this shit made me miss the radio. This book made me miss the radio. The radio for what it was. Well, because she was, and, and, and as she pointed out, very, very rightfully so, they were the social media of the day. We didn't have social right. media. We didn't have internet. So you had to listen to their, they were the ones that updated you on what was happening. Right. You had to be plugged and in. In the had culture, you had to be plugged in or you didn't know what was going on. Like, that's yep. why I wanted to be in New York because they were at the epicenter of everything that was going on all the time. Unfortunately, she starts to detail, and this is the part where I started to break down. Like, I was literally crying in this part of the book. When she started talking about the East Coast, West Coast beef and Suge Knight. Yeah. And I don't know. We're, we're like a step removed from that. Yo, I, look. Mm-hmm. Her talking about when she was in, when she, when that whole shit popped off. I'm going to avoid saying a certain person's name so I can avoid the button, and you know who that is. Mm-hmm. And like the whole New York, New York, when Snoop and the Dog Pound came through and crushed the buildings, and Moni Love, poor thing, was in the video, and everybody started 
jumping on her. She she was catching hell for it. But at but at first it wasn't supposedly about that. It was supposedly right. about them showing love to New York. That's what they but, said. But, I didn't get that from the video I saw. I didn't either. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I mean that may have happened in retrospect. Like because you remember they filmed the video maybe after because that video got the people got shot at. Mm-hmm. So maybe after that happened, they were like, fuck them motherfuckers. And then they started doing, you know, stuff to make it worse when it wasn't at first, like in the editing process. You know what I mean? Yeah. It might have been it's done in retrospect. Yeah. But, you know, Angie felt like she was in the middle of, of all that shit because, you know, Tupac wanted her to come out there and be in his video for um, I Ain't Mad At You. She was like, are you fucking crazy right now? That would have destroyed uh-huh. East Coast hip hop. Well, Faith had already done the, done a song with um with him, and of course, of course that whole notorious you know the, he, the Mona uh, Love but he the kept he claimed, almost he, claimed, he claimed he no he claimed that he had sex with Faith. That's what fucked everything up. It start yeah, but I'm I'm saying like, can you imagine? Can you imagine after the Money Love cameo to have an Angie Martinez cameo too and do the same thing? But him saying he fucked Biggie's wife is what really fucked that. That shit was up. a that was a shot at the jugular too. That was straight for the throw. To this day, I don't know who told the truth. Who <laughs> who knows if he was if he was lying? Cause she, she adamantly. Denies having sex with Tupac. Well, at the time, in the moment, if you were faced, would you bone Tupac? She was pissed at Biggie, and that shit would hurt him. Well, there you go. <laughs> but it doesn't mean she actually did it. That's that's enough speculation to swing the pendulum. Yeah, I don't know that whole that whole her book, her book with um that Tupac situation um. I don't know. It kind of made me look at Tupac kind of funny. Tupac need counseling, and I was stand by that. Tupac need to Yeah, I, yeah, I understand that part of it, but it's still I don't know. It kind of made me look at him funny because like he talk about, I mean, like you know, basically like you know, using that all that energy that was built up over the East Coast West Coast thing is like some type of you know war tactic. You know, so the East Coast, those East Coast rappers or particular East Coast rappers can't make money or whatever the case may be. And, you know, using faith as a uh, as a tactic oh, wow. in the situation. Yeah. And then it made me it made me sit there and think, like, so what so what type what agenda did you have? Like inviting Angie to your uh, video, that kind of shit. Like, I was just like, yeah. I don't the same, know. The same agenda he had when they invited Moni Love to do the other job. Well, then he said, or he said to her, he says to her when Angie showed up to do the interview, because he invited her to do the interview instead. Well, she told him to come there, and he was like, I can't come there because I'm doing a movie, but he's like, I'll fly you out here. So she went out there to do the interview, and then when they were talking, he brought up the fact that, yeah, I fuck Faith, and, and you see when I asked you to be in the video, what you did, you turned me down, like... Then why did you ask her? Well, I mean, was it a fucking massive test to see what she was going to do? Exactly. See that? Yeah, that's how I took it. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. And see, that's some crazy ass Jimmy. I'm a Gemini shit right there. <laughs> Pop needs a counseling. He needs a, he needs a full time psychiatrist. Oh my god! But I mean, when she talked about you know Pac and being cool with him, I like how she edited the the interview so that it kept the best of what he was talking about and left that crazy shit on the cutting room yeah. floor. Yeah. But I do not like yeah. how you know who called in and was like, "Ed Lover goes and he hears what she's editing in there." on the show and then goes and run and tell you know who and you know who gonna call to the station like I don't think she should air the um Tupac interview it's just gonna cause more problems between the east and uh-huh, west coast yeah run to uh-huh. that ass boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay I gotta say his name Puffy uh, uh-huh. uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, he earned crazy. that wholeheartedly. He earned that. He got that. But Take everybody that. knows. That. Everybody just knows he's a slime, slimey. Such a slime ball. Do you get props for being gay, sir? <sighs> Do you get props for that? <laughs> he the gangster that rappers pretend to be. Kaiser fucking Sozak! Kaiser Sozak! Do you get props for that? Puffy is the gangster that Biggie was pretending to be. Okay. Oh, 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 allegedly. Allegedly. Kaiser Sozak. Allegedly. <laughs> On your ass, right there. But she she does she gives a detail, you know, about Pac dying and then Biggie dying and like I was face down crying because yeah, I remember that, was... that I was I I remember where I was when I heard Tupac die and I was a mess and I I remember where I was well when he got shot at first and went to the hospital. And she was right. We, he had been shot before. He'd always been shot. People thought he was just, oh, he'll she shot. He'll be all right. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember hearing. Uh, I don't remember hearing about when Tupac got killed. But I remember um, specifically being in the car hearing that shit on the radio when Biggie died. I, I, I remember hearing about when Tupac got killed. I remember that. I remember both of them. Yeah. I, and 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 she calls that. She calls it an end of innocence. And she's like, I always tell you all, like, we knew that Pop would never be the same anymore after that. We understood that the shit, like, the shit was over in a certain way. Like, that was the, that was the ending. Yeah, I don't think everybody knew to the extent at the time, though. (laughs) Is it safe to say that Jay-Z and I just had the same way? Um, I don't Mm, I don't know about that. You don't know about that. Nah, it's not gangster. <laughs> well, there's parts of it where she starts talking about her own rap career and um, how she got onto the Ladies Night remix. Well, first, Karis put her on. I forgot she had verses. I forgot she had verses out there. Well, I yeah, I know that. Um, I ain't know that uh, KRS, uh, you know, started her rapping or whatever, but that's kind of dope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he he, he um, put her on a song and they called it, uh, what did they call it? They call it um, Heartbeat. Uh, heartbeat. Yep. And then, um, that was so, uh, she started talking about, she went back to Q-Tip and stuff, because cause they started dating in the beginning and they stopped dating. Then they started dating again, and I guess they were like, kind of like semi living with. She talked about <laughs> being at like with him in the crib when his crib burned down. I remember that too. That shit was woo. That must be all right. his vinyl. Yeah, that must all be of right. his vinyl. That shit hurt. Yeah. Hearing that story hurt me. <laughs> I like the I like the way she was talking about how they took pictures or whatever to um, soften the blow and like she said looking back how crazy them pictures look. <laughs> yeah. Her and um so and then her that's how her and Wendy Williams got into it. Dun, dun, dun. Wendy was Wendy was well Wendy was Wendy was on the show and she uh-huh. kept making reference to her dating Q-tip. Little side jabs. Like over and over again. Like that was part of her business. <laughs> That's what I could yeah, get. Wendy, why, why are you doing that? Yeah, Wendy and the way. And so she told her several times nicely. She did. She was like, and then all of a sudden, she has a whole website. Where she put up the yeah, there's certain, there's a certain person up here <laughs> dating Q-tip. And she was like, I waited for her to come out the bathroom and was like, <laughs> <laughs> like Wendy, the fuck are you doing? I told you, cut that shit out. She just looked at her and just like punched her in the face. Fight. <laughs> and Angie, Angie, Angie grabbed a mop handle. <laughs> I don't care. And Ann was like, oh, they got to do with that mop. What you gonna do with that mop, Wendy? 
Nothing. <laughs> but what messed it up? Wendy got on air and said nobody hit nobody. <laughs> that, was, that was a lie. She bowed out. She got the plea. <laughs> well, Ain't nobody what, hit nobody. What happened, what happened was two of my panels got into a fight. So a fight. Uh, I mean, fight. <laughs> Finish him. <laughs> and you know that well they both got suspended behind that and then they said that they they they, they actually fired with um wendy because wendy would have been causing so many wendy notoriously caused problems at that station i remember that the, at the time she was popular as hell but it's because of what aaron said people She's love to person. hate her they love to hate her yeah, she's that kind of person. So they both got suspended, but they couldn't they couldn't fire Wendy unless somebody went into her because she was on the afternoon drive time slot. And Angie was on the six to what ten at that time and she loved that mm-hmm. time period. But so they stuck her in the six to sorry, in the afternoon time slot. And they fired Wendy. Dun, dun, dun. That was um. There were some other colorful moments that she talks about, like you know Mary J. Blige helping her pay her rent. Yeah. Because <laughs> she almost got ejected working with the Neptunes on, on her second album. I that came out of nowhere. I couldn't understand how she got so many eviction notices. She got two. She got yeah. How? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, she said she was just she was being irresponsible, basically. Yeah. And then Neptune's and Pusher T and Mouse were trying to help her write rhymes, but she said they were all about drugs. I didn't know how yeah. to really. Do that. I, was like, <laughs> I was like, well, it was Pusher T and Malice for these. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord, what did she expect? But yeah, and they talked about Ether, of course, the very famous uh, they, Ether. The 11 part was tough. That 9/11 oh, part. It was very hard. The 9/11 part. I still remember where I was. Where were you on 9/11? She actually said that for Ether. Remember, she said that they did Battle of the Beats again to see which one of them was going to win, yeah. Nas or Jay Z. Yep. Jay-Z and not Jay-Z one. <laughs> Jay-Z, well, Jay Z was there for an interview. He walked in and they announced the winner. Flawless she had to picture. interview him after that. <laughs> like, I'm like, Jay, why would you do that? Because he thought he had a seal. He couldn't have thought that. He heard Ether. He thought he had a seal. People still think he had a seal. Aaron, they listening to him, but tell him what? Everybody. Yeah, tell everybody your theory about that. Man, that's some that's some other guys, man. Like they don't. What? Anybody? Anybody who don't know nothing? Anybody who don't know nothing about rap before Jay Z, man? I discredit. I discredit anything they got to say anyway. Fuck with you so like either teach you the key, you know that guys on the cross of belly. You fool you lost already. <laughs> well, she said she always was honest with Jay and she was never a yes man, so she was like, I'm, I'm sorry, that. but I'm Nas, Nas won. Yes, yeah, yeah. Like anybody anybody who knows anything about rap before, you know, Jay Z like understands like what that whole situation was. Even Jay Z knows better than that. <laughs> Yeah, I feel that you are right. So but the, um, in the moment, do you think in the moment it was different? No. Like he what you mean? Thought he, no. Like he legitimately thought he won? No. 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 <laughs> <Not at all. laughs> now, we were, all three of us were there for that shit. No. No one thought he won. No. <laughs> no, I'm saying, did Jay think he won? How could he think he won when anybody who knew anything about hip hop, like Aaron said, how could he think he won? No one thought he won. No one. <laughs> Except Bleak. And that's when oh, Bleak started the wow. beef in the, in the first fucking place. 
as airy as now for to be. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. At least Memphis Bleak was good for something. He was good for nothing. We wouldn't have Easter today if it wasn't for Memphis Bleak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Not, so, in, so inadvertently, Nas owes his career to Mrs. Blake. Possibly, quite possibly, we would not have life as good if Mrs. Blake never I took drugs. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Memphis Bleak. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's crazy. It's funny so, so last two break. things before we get out of this period, because uh, we're almost done. But um, Nas wanting—I remember Nas want to do this too. Nas wanted to hang a fake Jay Z at the summer jam. That's a bit much. I, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. That's a bit much. That's a bit much. It was. It was a bit much. That's a really L. That's a meat. That's a meat mill move. Yeah. That's what I thought too. I was like, that's some meat mill shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an L. Take that. Yeah, you got that. Like, Hold guys, that. why did you? And he had won the battle. Like, why were you still on that shit? Yeah. He hold that L for eternity. Okay, so question to y'all this is the last thing I'm gonna ask. Do you like that whole R. Kelly situation? Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> I oh, remember man. I, I was y'all teacher when that shit happened. I remember this. So we, we didn't get that story then. No, I was y'all teacher when that happened because that was when they were doing Best of Both Worlds. Yeah. They were on the Best of Both Worlds tour. I was teaching y'all that. And really? R. Kelly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You all remember Best of Both Worlds? Yeah, I remember yeah. Best of Both Worlds, unfortunately. But and R. Kelly was like, he, he like she said he came in with pepper spray in his face. Like he I didn't spray himself. I can't, I can't perform like this. Dude. I can't. I can't perform whether this. Do we really think he actually did something to him? <laughs> Do we I think that know. he pepper spray himself, or do we think that Jay Z actually did something to this dude? I'm questioning if this is the pepper spray itself. I don't know. You think Jay Z would pepper spray somebody? Yeah, I do. think that the pepper spray was a couple <laughs> of tears. Because he was crying because niggas pulled a strap on him. He was crying because niggas pulled a strap on him. And he said, oh, that was pepper spray, man. They pepper sprayed me first. They pepper sprayed me. They pepper sprayed me and then pulled out the guns. Hey, yo. And, and, yo, Anthony, let's talk about some of the shifty shit that Jay has done and acting like he ain't do shit. I mean, I don't know. To pepper spray a man that didn't pull a gun out on him, that's a little excessive. I don't know. Like he stabbed Lance on Rivera, dude. But yeah. I don't think the pepper spray was uh, 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 an ingredient in that situation. So I'm saying he stabbed dude, and then when anybody ever tries to get Jay Z to admit he stabbed that dude, J- Jay will avoid. The- it's like the shit never happens. He's never gonna yeah. own up to it. He had a mean paralegal. That's all. <laughs> Look. That's all. Uh, I'm just I saying, wouldn't admit I to it either. I'm be, just saying. I'm thinking he might be anybody. capable of shit like that because he doesn't own up to anything. But I'm not questioning that there was a situation. I'm just questioning the existence of the pepper spray. He didn't pepper spray his damn self. <laughs> there was no pepper spray that was tears. <laughs> no. Angie said when he came in, she could see in his face that somebody, she said, there's a very distinct difference between your tears and what you look like <laughs> after you get she pepper said, sprayed. She said he looked oh, like he been crying. <laughs> he looked like he been crying. <laughs> he looked like he been crying. <laughs> she she said, said his face was red and he been crying. He said, you could tell he had the pepper spray. Yeah. Yes. You could tell I don't, wait, I don't know if he just been crying at heart. <laughs> oh, I don't, nah, nah. I don't know. I don't know. He's from Chicago. He's from Chicago. I guess it's like, I guess it's like. I don't know. What's that supposed to mean? <laughs> but. I might be offended by that last comment. What? He from Chicago. I give him some slack. Yeah. 
No, I was just saying at first maybe he was crying that much, but now I'm saying no, nah, maybe not. Maybe maybe it's some of the to to be in pepper spray before going on stage. Okay, well we got six minutes left, so we gotta figure out I think we we went back and forth about who we were gonna do for recess today. So that was the end of our um of our second period, everybody. So um I want to give out homework before we do that, just because then we can just finish talking the rest of the show out. Homework. Um, nope. Next week, we're going to be talking about conscious rappers. Oh, snaps. Why don't conscious rappers like the title conscious rapper? Whatever. <laughs> Nobody likes anything anymore. I never understood that. I don't like this. I don't like this title. I don't like that being called a mumble rapper. Like, like Talib Kweli <laughs> cannot deny being a conscious rapper. Because yeah. it is. I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of limiting when you think about it. It's limiting, but that's what he is. <laughs> um, they've limited themselves. It's what exactly. they do. He doesn't talk about shiny rims, so. I've yet to hear him talk about his rims. See, but that's what I'm saying, like, because if you're saying that, then what constitutes a mainstream rapper? See, that's what I'm saying. Shiny Room? Mainstream rapper. Mainstream rapper <laughs> ain't talk about anything. Um, I guess. Well, it's mostly talk about drugs in our last culture. That's so hey, I guess it just Yeah, I guess it just so depends on the era. <laughs> so mm-hmm. disturbing. Leave that shit. Just say no. Well, last era selling drugs, this era taking them. Did you know yeah, Kendrick Lamar don't know who Smokey the Bear is? <laughs> I've asked yeah, a bunch of kids if they know who Smokey the Bear is, and they all yeah, I ain't really that. surprised. That shit is old, and that's very old. They don't put those PSAs out anymore like that. But don't they know yeah. that only they can prevent forest fires? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's an important message. Like come they on. don't give a crap about that. <laughs> When would they be in a forest? <laughs> really? <laughs> Actually, in Philadelphia, you could easily be in a forest. Right. What about a kid in California where they're known to get the whole state catch on fire? Like brush fires and brush fires in California. <laughs> the whole state, like one more than the whole state of California is on fire. Like, Hell yeah. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> They need so 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 who so who's homework who's homework today and huh huh homework, Sorry, who, homework. Are we Sorry. who's recess who's recess? recess we got a couple options for recess no we don't <laughs> <laughs> we have one option what's the and, one we got a couple options for recess I mean there's a lot and, of people and Aaron Aaron what's the option oh um, man. <laughs> I think we should talk about that school Zen podcast. That's what it's I think. It's a school Zen podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we're supposed to be we're supposed to be objective. <laughs> That's not no, very objective. Not. We're never objective. We talk about everybody. Well, you're right. We're not we're not the media. We're not the media. <laughs> we just have a platform. Yep. Okay, I can see. <laughs> and the school in podcast gets the. I'm determined to add a Whitaker. We need an audio Whitaker. An audio Whitaker. An audio I Whitaker. I need to maybe know. Like a, maybe like a, a, a sample of one of his lines from a movie or something. We got to find the most ratchet movie we can find. Can we use that? <laughs> can we use that? Oh, uh, that's a whole nother question. Uh, yeah, that's uh, going to be an issue. Maybe something he said on Jason's lyric or something. I don't know. Or a Sprite commercial. Oh, not Jason's <laughs> lyric, though. Oh, no. Jason's lyric is like the worst movie you can use to pull a Whitaker. <laughs> That's a must. I'm campaigning for the audio of Whitaker, ladies and gentlemen. Like, oh, wasn't your name Mad Dog in that movie? Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, Mad Dog, no! 
<laughs> yeah, court, we need that. Insert that. Especially when we're talking about people like Wendy, Wendy and Pendulum Doom Williams. Uh, is she as bad as Puffy? She might. Damn it. No, no, no. Puffy takes the cake, he eats the cake, he bakes the cake, he sells the cake. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, nah, Puffy, nah, Puffy, the end, nah. You said nah. it twice! Stop saying yeah. Puffy! <laughs> I just can't get over how evil he is. Puffy can't even get over how evil he is. He, he's old school Lex Luthor with the body. He ain't curly top Lex Luthor, he baldy Lex Luthor. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is our show. (laughs) School is officially out. Jesus Christ, man. Keep up in the (laughs) acting. Oh, my God. (laughs) Why do you have to say puppy like 80 times? I got caught up in a moment. I got caught up in a moment. That's what he does to you. That's what he does. I don't know. I think Wendy is starting to get puffy esque. She the female version. Of something. 